the last two years or even the last few months. So we see that there is a lot of physical demand in both gold and silver. And that is a story on the physical front. People still want the physical, even though the psychological trading pattern on COMEX to trade gold and silver is sitting below 24, 15, 2000, because those are big trading levels and traders don't want to go over unless they have a reason. Welcome to Gold Silver Pros. Searching for the best precious metals deal? Shop with our trusted partner, Arc Silver. Access special deals on silver, gold, and platinum through our website or call 307-264-9441. Hey everybody, this is Rob Keens with goldsilverpros.com. This is your weekly market update for March 31st, 2023. I'm recording this about 1235 uh, Central Time. You guys should see it on the channels a little bit later today. In the weekly market wrap up, we start by talking about the market and the recent economic data. So go ahead and dive into that. We start with gold. Gold is trading up uh, overall in the week, although slightly down about 10 bucks on the day at 1968.48. A lot of times it'll end down the week on a big week up. So if it does end the week down, don't worry too much. It happens to the precious metals. It's a little bit of consolidation after a frothy week. And usually when gold moves up, one or two percentage points, you see a little bit of a consolidation that comes back down. Uh, silver at 23.97, it's actually up 10 cents on the day, but overall a good week for both uh, gold and silver. Positive news the last couple of weeks for gold and silver fans who have been interested in gold and silver. Of course, the bad news that caused that was a banking crash, which we'll get into here a little bit more in just a moment. Going to go over the biggest economic data of the week. We do this every week to give you an idea of all the different things that are occurring in the economy. And I do curate and filter this a little bit, so I won't read them all. But the ones that kind of stick out to me is the U.S. trade balance in goods. That's the difference between what we buy and what we sell as a nation was negative ninety one point six billion dollars overall. Not too bad. I've seen that uh, a lot worse. And a lot of the reason, however, that that's coming down is because according to Market Watch, the headline that I've been talking about and that they're talking about today is that higher inventories offset the slight rise in trade deficit, meaning we had a better showing in our current account. We exported more than we imported, but that's because we have inventories. That's because the consumers can't buy. That's because the consumer's not in the best of shape. And that's what that means. So that's not necessarily a great thing, even though We did a better job at managing the amount of money we spent versus amount of money coming in as a nation. It's because the consumer is tapped out and they just don't have a whole lot more money. The S&P Case-Shiller Home Price Index rose 2.5%. It was 4.6 last month. So the, the rate of increase in home prices is decelerating. It's been that way for seven or eight months for the most part. And so we have uh, a little bit of a pricking of the real estate bubble, though not a bursting of the real estate bubble, just letting a little bit of air out. Just kind of hit that balloon, you know, with with the hot, uh, the hot safety pin, let a little bit of that air out. But we haven't had a crash in real estate yet. It's just slowing down, still still going strong. Uh, the home price index is up 5.3%. That's come off last month was up 6.6%. So again, a deceleration in home prices. Consumer confidence is high at 104.2. The consumer feels good, even though they're basically living on credit. That could be a little bit of euphoria from uh, ending up last year pretty, a little bit pretty strong. But I don't see a reason for the consumer to be overly confident, given that asset prices are going down, given that we've just had bank failures. But that's a lagging indicator and confident will continue to track you as consumer confidence going Forward uh, GDP was up 2.6%. So we had a positive quarter. That's a very good thing. Initial jobless claims on the unemployment front are up 198,000 this month. That was 191 last month. And continuing jobless claims continue to be sticky at about 1.69 million, same place that they had been before. Personal incomes rose 0.3%. Wages had gone up a little bit. We'd seen that data earlier. The Chicago business barometers at 43.8. That's not a great number. We want it to be around 50 or higher. So it's not positive necessarily. And the PCE, which is an alternative inflation measure that the Fed and the government uses, it's very similar to the CPI, but slightly different. It's sitting at 5%, indicating that we still have high inflation, although it's going and it has been coming down from previous months. The markets overall are up. The Dow Jones is up today as Wall Street looks to end the first quarter on a high note. That is the Headline from CNBC, Dow Jones up 240 points, S&P up 32, NASDAQ up 133, and Russell up 26.36. All of them about uh, three quarters of a percent or higher. 
the Russell uh, re recovered the most because it's a small cap index, the Russell 2000. It tends to be more volatile, much like silver in the precious metals market. So you see that move around a little bit more. Overall bond rates uh, uh, rose a little bit this week, which surprised me a bit. They had fallen a little bit, I think, in anticipation of the Fed cutting interest rates. The Fed didn't cut interest rates, so the bond market started to rise again. The two-year rose a back up over four at 4.085. Of course, it's inverted from the 10-year at 3.507. When you have higher short-term interest rates in the bond market, it means people are expecting a recession. So that recession indicator is still there. Overall, the cryptocurrencies have done very well. Bitcoin has recovered nicely. It's approaching 30,000 right now, sitting at 28,294.06. Ethereum is up also 2.53% on the day, 18,2643. It's a faster riser today than is Bitcoin. Uh, Litecoin is up about a percent at 89.22. And so far, XRP is unchanged. So the cryptos are doing pretty well. The bond market is sort of okay, moving sideways. The stock market's recovering. The gold market's doing well. That's your market report. Going to give you a couple of big stories before we get into analyzing the gold and silver markets. The biggest story of the week in terms of long term has been de dollarization. For example, uh, China has negotiated a deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia, not known as the closest of friends, previously had been enemies, negotiated a deal for uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran to do trade and to do business outside the U.S. dollar. Additionally, this week, China and Brazil have struck a deal to ditch the U.S. dollar. I'm going to read here from the article uh, on Zero Hedge, along with a quote from Elon Musk. It says here, in a time when de-dollarization news are dropping fast and furious, and even Elon Musk is now jumping on the bandwagon, a tweet that Elon Musk put out on March 29, 2023, says, combined with the excess government spending, which forces other countries to absorb a significant part of our inflation. He's talking about de-dollarization there. So everybody's noticing de-dollarization. Beijing's latest salvo against the almighty greenback, which is hooking up Brazil, a major uh, South American economy with China. And again, that's the Belt and Road Network. Uh, the BRIC nations and the Belt and Road Initiative are all moves for China to build a large global uh, commodities market that circumvents the Western markets, the COMEX, the CME group, all of those, China's building alternative network and they're doing a lot of work there. And that's going to continue to push down the demand for uh, dollars, which means all dollars held in any country overseas. They're called euro dollars. They don't have to be held just in Europe. They can be in China, can be anywhere. But they're called euro dollars because originally most of them were held by Europe, our major trading partner. All of those foreign dollars are starting to flood back into the U.S. And so the euro dollar futures are coming down. The demand for dollars outside the U.S. is coming down. As people de-dollarize, those are flooding back into the U.S. It's going to increase liquidity of dollars in the U.S., but it's also going to create a lot of inflation. So expect uh, another round of inflation. Not just quite yet. I think it'll be another couple of months, but we're going to start to see a round of inflation as those euro dollars start to come back into the U.S. Another big story this week was something a little bit more practical for those in corporate America. The uh, the era of remote work is ending for millions of Americans, and it's starting to come back to where companies want people to work in a designated building for the company and not from their homes. Because the results that a lot of these companies are getting from a, all of their employee for, workforce being distributed at home were that, well, you're not getting the collaboration you get when people are in the office, and you're not getting the type of productivity that you get when people are in the office. So. A lot of companies are trying to claw back their workers who are now working at home and having a hard time. A lot of workers don't want to come back. A recent uh, survey by ZipRecruiter said that job seekers on average would take 14% pay cut to stay home and work remotely. Why? Well, because they're probably because they don't have to buy business clothes. They don't have to pay for gas. They don't have to sit in traffic and they don't have to deal with those types of things. And yes, of course, they'd be willing to work from home. Employers are trying to call them back. One of the first was uh, Meta CEO Mike Zuck. Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook fame, who originally started doing this a few months ago. Elon Musk is trying to recall Twitter workers. Um, Walt Disney has been recently pushed for four-day work week on site to get people on site so they can have a three-day week and off site. That's a compromise over the existing system where people are just trying to get people to come back to the site. And employees are saying, no, we want to stay off site. Uh, the Walt Disney system of the four-day on site work week and a three-day work week at home may be a way to compromise. We'll follow that. It's an important trend going on in corporate America because you never really know, you know, how that's going to, how labor 
and productivity is going to affect things like GDP, wage rates, inflation. And this is a pretty big thing. So we'll see if remote work continues and the U.S. worker can continue to be sharp at home and deliver at home or if we're all going to go back into the workplace. Certainly from a financial standpoint, that would be a boon to the commercial real estate market, which has taken it on the chin since the pandemic in which a lot of people work from home and a lot of leases were not renewed and a lot of commercial real estate, office space especially, is sitting out there looking for a home and rates have come down, thereby crashing a lot of the commercial real estate market and affecting REIT investments, passive real estate investments. Those are all things that we'll be watching uh, different parts of the economy as well. We're going to present now and go into the piece on the gold and silver where it's CME Group looking at volume and open eye. You can see since the bank crashes, we've had a, a large increase in the gold in the silver trade, as you can see here on the charts. Um, and that makes sense because people are going to safety. So they're going to be increased demand for gold. As we look at what's going on, the dominant contract here overwhelmingly is June because it has almost 400,000 open interest contracts on the market at once. And it added 5,000 on a single day yesterday. Most of those 5,000 came off the April contract, which is no longer the dominant contract. So we're not going to look at that one. There is some still some trade in April. We're still getting some exchange for fiscal from April over to London. We're still getting a lot of exchange for fiscal in gold uh, over to London in June, which is now the dominant contract month. And as we look at Thursday's data, you can basically tell there wasn't a lot of a uh, a little bit of exchange for physical, um, not too much interesting in Thursday's data. We'll go over to Wednesday's data. You can see 24,000 contracts moved from April to June. So clearly the traders are trading the June contract. You saw 380, uh, I'm sorry, 879 exchange for physical over to London market to get physical access on that June contract and 58 deliveries of the existing March contract. Right now we only have four contracts open in March. That's because we're at the end of the month. We have 26,000 in April. Some of those will probably be delivered, I'd imagine, but most of those will probably roll off into the June month. Looking at the settlement data on this tab, we get pricing and it gets a little confusing when you have a roller from one to another, but thankfully we had 139,000 contracts close for the June contract. So that's where we're going to look for our pricing data. It, it's fallen so far today. This is early Friday trading data. It's down about 11 bucks today to close at 1986.20. If we look at yesterday's trading action, Thursday, we were up $13.20 on the June contract. We almost touched on 2000 And here's something important I want you guys to understand. When I put up technical charts, especially when I write for Jam Bullion, or I put up a technical chart here on a video, and I'm talking about reaching a resistance point, it's a psychological point at which traders don't want to, on their own, trade above or below. 2000 is a big one for gold. So we're sitting at 1997 gold. And as we approach that, you could see we closed in 1997, but today the trading is to close below. So we actually lost 12 bucks. Why? Because traders are not ready to breach that $2,000 market. They need a piece of news or something to give them a reason to buy more gold. So even though gold probably from a physical perspective needs to have a higher price, the traders are going to sit right here under 2000 for a while until they find a reason that tells them to go higher. And it may be a bank failure. It may be bad economic data. We'll track that. Silver's been a lot less frothy since we've had the bank failures because silver is not the initial metal you go into for safety. Silver you go into after gold. Gold moves first. So we're seeing some increased trade in silver here on the charts, but not too much. Now there is a very hefty need for physical silver on the markets. You see a massive 2,700 contracts of silver exchange for physical on yesterday's data, that's five. That's 2,700 contracts of 5,000 ounce silver moving from the American market over to London in search of actual physical silver. Why? Because you can only deliver on the March contract and there's no more contracts. There's zero. So the last 15 contracts delivered yesterday on the March silver futures month, the rest of the trade is sitting here in May with a little bit in July. And so if you want physical, there wasn't enough contracts to get it right now on the COMEX. So you do the exchange for physical in the future and go over to London and see if they have it over there. That's why exchange for physical has gotten so much more important. A lot of people don't know what exchange for physical is. And so I'll come off uh, the share and we'll talk about that for a moment. Exchange for physical is when you say, I have exposure to gold or silver or some, some other commodity 
both in the American market and the London market. And you say, you know what? I, in, in the American market, this trading month doesn't have a lot of open contracts. So I can't get physical silver right now because the March doesn't have enough contracts. Remember, it's a futures market. So the paper is traded in the future, but the physical has to be traded today. So as traders move off the current month into a, the next futures month, if somebody wants to come in and get physical off that COMEX market, they can't do it in the current month. There's no there's no open interest, no open contracts. So what they do is they do exchange for physical over to London in a future month because the London OTC market, they'll trade you anytime you want. It's not necessarily a future market. So if you want to go get exposure there, you can trade a position on the American market for a position on the London market, either in physical or in paper format. And I think that's what's happening. And that's why we're seeing a lot of movement over to London because the, the current delivery market, you know, for silver and gold is not big uh, on American exchange in March. It wasn't just a, a huge month. May looks like it'll be quite a bit bigger. Then we'll see the summer months and then December. So if you want gold and silver now, you're going over to London. That's why I highlight the EFPs or exchange for physical because it shows how healthy that physical market is in the U.S. and how much we can't get that we got to go over to London to grab until we can get uh, more on the markets here, until we can start taking delivery in that June, July timeframe. So interesting to see that. Okay, we're here for silver settlement data for Friday, um, up 17 cents on the day across, oh, 51,749 contracts for the May contract, settling support 21, 24, sorry, 16 or 2415.6. We look at Thursday's data, we had another up day Trading on the dominant contract was May. It was up about 52 cents, a really nice move, a half dollar move on strong trading of 67,000 contracts. We're going to go look at the ETFs holdings where gold and silver are held for the ETFs, the passive funds. We're here looking at gold and we can tell on the COMEX, the U.S. market, there's been a net removal of about 400,000 ounces of gold over the last four weeks. Daily, there's about 4,000, 7,000 ounces taken off the American market. So some gold is coming off the American market, a modest amount. Net net of all gold flows between the London and U.S. markets, we had an increase in gold the last four weeks of almost 900,000 ounces. So if you take 900,000 minus the 400,000 we took out of COMEX, that means in London there was an increase of about 1.3 million ounces. It's kind of some quick math there. And if we look at the biggest of the ETFs by valuation and by total weight, They've added, the GLD has added 550,000 gold ounces over the last four, four weeks, last month, over, although over the last week it's been zero. So you see a little bit coming back in, although I'd like to point out that since silver squeeze of two years ago, gold has flowed off the COMEX. And even though we have some coming on now, it is not recovered to where it was. The same can be said for silver. We're going to click on the silver chart. Now we're on silver, looking at silver holdings in COMEX in the U.S., the last four weeks, we've had a bunch of silver flow off. You can see all the red there. And in the last day, you saw over a million ounces come right off the COMEX. Overall, you saw 17 million ounces come off between London and the U.S. exchanges. And that's a lot. And so silver is being demanded since silver squeeze. This is a silver squeeze where you had the peak in silver inventories and it's come off. And we've had a little bit flow on to uh, the COMEX and London markets in terms of silver recently, but it has not nearly made up for what's come off the last two years or even the last few months. So we see that there is a lot of physical demand in both gold and silver. And that is a story on the physical front. People still want the physical, even though the psychological trading pattern on COMEX to trade gold and silver is sitting below 24, 15, 2000, because those are big trading levels and traders don't want to go over unless they have a reason. What's the reason we need more news? We need something to come out to say why gold and silver should be more valuable macroeconomically or otherwise. So we'll stay tuned to that. That's, what, that's why we cover what we cover here in the weekly market wrap. It makes sense that we cover the economic indicators, the recent news and the move and the gold and silver markets to tie all those together for you. So it makes sense why things are happening on the market as they are. We do this every week on the weekly market wrap. That's what you guys just watched. Stay tuned to the channel on Fridays and Sunday, either Friday or Sunday, we'll publish this. It is both a look back on the previous week and a preview of the next week. So if you're a trader or you want to know what's going on in the markets, going over this 15 to 20 minute video every week will get you situated where you need to go. You get the, the most important things that have happened, the most important things we're going to look at to happen 
why prices are moving around what, where they are and a little bit as to what may happen in the future as well. That's what we do here on the Weekly Market Wrap. Thank you for attending it. We will see you next time. Till next time, this is Rob Kings with Gold Silver Pros. Hey, thanks for watching. We selected these videos just for you. Check them out. And remember, $4.99 a month keeps the lights on and the channel going. So join our Gold Silver Pro supporter membership. We appreciate your support. Keep stacking.